for you. So essentially, Blue Collar is here. He kind of wanted he wanted to speak. We want to hear his story, how he heard of crypto, uh, what's got him interested, and what his journey has been like thus far, what he has done in DeFi, and what he's looking forward to uh, doing in the future, and what he wants to learn. Just that kind of deal. Because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other people in the same boat, and uh, we can just go from there. Yeah, basically, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet everybody. I've been here for like the last week or so. It's really, uh, everything's been really informative and eye-opening. Um, as far as um, crypto goes, I had a little bit of experience back in like 2012. And back then, I wasn't doing the, the best of things. And that's how I got introduced to crypto. Uh, moving money around in nefarious type ways, I guess you could say, a long time ago. Um, but I always had that type of taste in my mouth from back then. So I knew in my mind at that point, this was a fly by night thing. You know, this is only used by certain people for certain things. And that's where I left it. Um, it started getting a little bit more mainstream. A lot of my friends were getting into it, talking about this crypto. Again, back in my mind, I say, hey, that's a past life. That's, you know, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. 2016 happened. And then, you know, uh, a couple of my buddies were heavily, heavily investing at the time, 40, 50,000 when, you know, everything crashed. And they said, please just put some money in, put some money in. And I go, listen, I just had this thing in my head. It's, it's not what you think it is. And then, you know, fast forward now, what we know now, and the landscape is totally, totally changed. And, uh, Ever since then, it just, it piqued my interest just because, you know, I would have been multi hundred million dollar man right now had I just used the money that I was moving around back then. So um, basically, um, it just intrigues me so much that we're headed towards this new digital world. And like my name states, blue collar blockchain, all I know is working hard and working, you know, with my hands and, you know, technology is not my thing, not my thing at all. And I'm seeing a lot of the older generation talking about it, but, you know, like me, very skeptical because it's not what they know. And I'm basically in, in like a position like in the middle, like um, I can see both sides of the spectrum. And the more I dig deep into DeFi and NFTs and the whole space, it more and more it intrigues me and the more I want to learn. So I know that I'm at the lowest, you know, part of the totem pole right now but i have the open-mindedness enough to learn and want to become better so that's basically where i'm at right now and uh yeah that's basically it awesome so so effectively you're investigating everything you're familiarizing yourself with everything and maybe still a little skeptical uh but want to know more dive a little deeper that way you can really see what this whole thing is about and what I see it as and what I've always seen it as is essentially the the future of finance in a lot of different ways. I mean, one of the greatest ways that it provides value immediately, not only to the entire financial industry as, as an enterprise, as a, as a business, but furthermore, and more importantly, in my opinion, far more importantly, uh, for the consumer, no matter where you are. Right. Because right now, if you want to transfer money from like to somebody, they have to be registered with a, an account and all this other stuff and with a centralized service. And it's very there's a lot of friction. Right. So like right now, if I wanted to send money using a bank to, let's say, uh, Doza, who's in another country or anyone else. Right. It would it would be a little challenging. But now if I, I could just ask for his, <laughs> his Ethereum wallet address and send it over and it'll be there in a couple of minutes. And we don't have to register for anything. If you're already in crypto, like you're ready to do anything anywhere in the metaverse, on any dApp, anywhere. It is the coolest thing. And just that that reduction in friction is just game changing in so many different ways. Um, and furthermore, just with the, the sort of complex and sophisticated financial tooling that you have at your disposal. Uh, for example, I know we were chatting a little bit, Blue Collar, and you, and you set yourself up with Wonderland, right? right. And so essentially, you are able to uh, provide liquidity, provide uh, value into a reserve that is going to basically be that backs the the future dollar of the entire crypto space. And that's why you see these crazy yields right now, because they are right now building out their treasury as much as possible. Not any different from the current uh, like Federal Reserve of the US, right? They need to have a lot of money that backs the dollar. And that's exactly what they've done. Um, and so this is just it on on Ethereum, 
And if everything's moving to Ethereum, which I believe it is because it is the most secure, most decentralized network that can connect anyone anywhere, then it's like, why wouldn't you want to be one of the early ones to provide value to that and reap the returns? Because they want to pay you for helping them propel this entire future. And so that's why Olympus is such a game-changing product. Um, already there's a stable coin. There's um, DAI, and it's very similar, but right now that's pegged to the dollar. Right. And so it's not a it's not a, a crypto native unit of account, but that's what Olympus is building with Ohm. And so that's just one of the fantastic products uh, that's come out of Ethereum, among many, many others. And and just being able to, again, have one wallet address that can interface with everything just makes life super easy. Um, but that's just a little bit on, on the financial side of things. And then with regard to NFTs, just allowing people to express their their themselves as whatever they want instead of being limited to you know whoever may be around you and whatnot like if you go on facebook right like you can't really uh express yourself uniquely if you download a profile picture or you set your pro other than of course you, you know could put a picture of yourself but maybe you don't really you know you want to you want to express some other part of your your personality right and now you can do that with a with an nft right and that's why there's so many profile picture nfts because like dreamers, for example, right? Let's say there's a, an alien, right? But there's also like the zombie one, um, or there's one that's smoking or whatever, right? There's all kinds of different things and ways that you can express yourself. Or if you really like Mega Man, there's a Mega Man, um, all that good stuff. And so that's that's kind of the future that we're headed where everybody is going to represent themselves through a unique uh, profile picture. And everyone is going to also be able to purchase unique items or unique articles of clothing. Um, and wear them in the metaverse and in any metaverse, whether that's Decentraland or crypto voxels, what have you. Um, and so that's just a little bit about an overview. But it's super cool to hear that you uh, have not only had some exposure to crypto in the past, uh, but furthermore, that you are coming back to it. And the coolest part is that you're still super early. Like if you think about if you go outside and I've done this for so long, like years, as long as I can remember, um, I would walk like when especially uh, if I go out into the city. Um, and I'm walking around, I would just randomly ask someone like, hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? And uh, like back in 2015, it was almost always a no. 2016 was like, yeah, it's some kind of digital money or some crap like that, right? And then 2017, you know, there was a lot of euphoria and people started hearing about it, but I still heard no a lot, you know? And, and even if you do that same thing now, generally people are still very skeptical, you know? And I think also, there's a lot of uh, a lot of FOMO and a lot of resentment where people feel like, oh, I heard about that thing before. I didn't take it seriously. It's gone up in value. It has to be a scam because I yep. don't have it, right? Yep. Whereas people exactly. who got in, <laughs> whereas people who got in really early are like, yeah, of course this is the future because they probably already played with a lot of this stuff going on in this space and see the value of it immediately. And so whenever somebody fuds, uh, you know, casts some fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and doubt ask them have you ever actually used any of this stuff and i can guarantee you that it's going to be a no because if once they see what you can actually do and understand it there's no way you can go back to traditional finance uh and, and furthermore just like living in a land where things are analog and, and and full of a lot of friction but yeah so that those are just my thoughts it's super cool for sharing your story thanks yeah no problem at all and so like it, who else has been I, i'm super interested in hearing like who else um maybe got into crypto before didn't take it really too seriously and if he got back in is that i feel like a, that's the case for a lot of people especially <laughs> during like 2018 2019 during the ice age uh that there was uh is there anyone else who kind of rode that wave too oh uh, yes i bought ethereum at 200 and sold it in like 2017 Oh, okay. That well, it definitely was peaking around there, so I don't blame you for that at all. We saw like a from there, two hundred went all the way up to four fourteen hundred. So that was a nice little seven x. And you know, when you see you know those kinds of returns, it's very easy to to want to sell out because you know the, those are some juicy returns. And and back then there was a still a lot of uh, uncertainty, and there weren't a whole lot of DApps, right? There was only like MakerDAO, um, and that was about it. Um, and so unless you were really close. Uh, with the technology and you understood it deeply, it was really hard to see where this thing could go. 
Um, and so that's why generally, you know, for years, you saw mostly people who were in technology who had been buying this stuff. A lot of nerds, you know, and everyone hates nerds and so make fun of us. Um, but, you know, now now everyone can can be a nerd and join this whole thing. And, and it is so cool to see so many different, like when I'm on crypto Twitter and just seeing all the NFTs that are out there nowadays, like it is so fun and super cool um, and a lot more colorful, you know, like the internet is getting weird again, right? I feel like things have gotten really boring and bland with Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, it was just the same old thing. It was just like, it's like Twitter had made itself just a news mm -hmm. platform, but now it's like a place for people to share themselves and share their thoughts. And it's just become a far more interesting place. And, and with so much more to come, I think uh, this space, if you're not involved in it now, you know, I, I kind of feel bad for you uh, because you're really missing out on not only, of course, great financial returns in the long run, but also more importantly, in my opinion, a lot of fun and what will be one of the most interesting uh, renaissances in the entire <laughs> history of mankind. Like if you think about it, there are a lot, a lot of like, um, parallels between what's happening now and what happened back in the Italian Renaissance, right? There's this huge explosion of art. Artists, instead of having to go, like whether you're in music or if you're a painter or what, what have you, um, back then you had patrons, right? You had like the Medici family, right? Funded a lot of artists because they liked their art. And today, you know, if you're an artist, it's really hard to monetize yourself. But now as an artist, you can easily punch, put out an NFT. And if people love it, they're gonna buy it and you're gonna get rewarded immediately. Not only on that first sale, of course, but also any secondary sales. Whereas like nowadays in the, the traditional world, you need to worry about royalties and all that good stuff. And, and you can get screwed in bad contracts. But now this this completely cuts them out, cuts out the middleman, which is the, the biggest thing. You need to get rid of the middleman. That way you can have a connection with your audience. And those they're essentially your patrons now. And instead of having to just have one patron, you can have the entire world be your patron and fund your art. And that's why there have been so many artists who have just completely changed their lives uh, in the past like year. Um, and I think once every artist understands that, I mean, we're gonna have just this an, an even bigger explosion of art. And already, like I mentioned before, there are clothing lines who are getting into this because if you can make a one of one Gucci bag and you have that on Ethereum, <laughs> like that's pretty sick. Um, and if you can bring it in with into any metaverse with you, like that is the coolest thing. Um, so I'm super excited and, and I'm super happy that everyone's here learning more about it because, you know, this is not a zero sum game. Everybody can win. Anybody can contribute and be a part of this because we are so early that there's just a whole green open field for everyone to run in. So again, super appreciate everyone being here and I'm happy to be here. So long live Ethereum and don't sell it. Yeah, right. <laughs> That'd be a bad decision. Yeah, like I actually, everything that I have, I <laughs> the first thing I do is convert it to ETH and, and then I run it through my stack. That way I don't ever have to sell any of it ever. Um, right. And, then, you know, using DeFi, you can draw value. So pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, we were, we were talking today about, you know, when I um, when I stopped thinking about money as fiat currency and started concerning myself with uh bitcoin and eth and thinking about that as my real money you know what i mean and how do i multiply my eth and how do i multiply my bitcoin you know and instead of or whatever it is whatever your asset is of choice you know what i mean it's like you know it, it's a whole different paradigm you know yeah, so my buddy, that's how he kind of explained pairs to me and working with pairs, you know, it was just easy to understand that way. So I was like, oh, okay. Ding. Yeah, essentially it's like you, I mean, in the world that we're heading, you are essentially your own bank, right? And so being your own bank and just like a bank, shouldn't you also have your own reserve, right? And so you can choose what you want to be your reserve, whether that's Bitcoin or ETH or any other tokens that you're really, really long on. Um, you can basically have them back everything that you spend, right? And so you can go ahead and like stuff ETH into something or into Olympus, whatever you want, right? Convert it as needed. Um, I would say ETH first because that's where we're going to see the biggest gains in the next couple of years. Um, and then you go ahead and, and borrow against that and then you go ahead and start spending that, right? 
because with ETH going up, anything you spend is going to be nominal compared to the returns that you have in the future. So ETH is your reserve, and then you can go ahead and, and draw liquidity from that. Hey, Damien, I have a question. Sure. So I bought ETH at um, 1500 and sold it at 2000 a couple of months back. Um, so since you're saying don't sell, is now a good time to buy? <laughs> well, so I would say it depends on what kinds of returns you have you want and also whether like how capitalized you are right so if you want to like 10x 20x in like the next three four months um i would say buy some eth um but if you i mean it's in the all the DeFi tokens right it's like everyone who got into eth and bitcoin years ago uh, have, have they've seen phenomenal returns, right? That was like the first generation of crypto natives. And there's still a whole lot of room for new crypto natives, but where the real riches are going to be made going forward are going to be in DeFi tokens because they are essentially all of the new, uh, they're building out this entire new financial structure. And so something to do and that I like to do is look at traditional finance and look at all the different financial products that are out there right now for, for normies and look for the digital crypto equivalents that are popping up in this world now. And you got to obviously look at the ones that are most popular there and then find them over here. That way you can go ahead and buy into them, support those products um, now, those projects now. That way, as their token appreciates uh, and, and everyone from traditional finance starts to flood in because they will and they already are, um, you're going to be able to ride that wave. And so uh, I would say, is buying ETH a good idea? Absolutely. Is it to maximize the like your return from this bull run? Mm, I would buy some, go ahead and dollar cost average in, but be on the hunt for other products uh, that are going to really, really uh, bring value and revolutionize the their traditional counterpart. Hey, Damien. So like, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask because I'm looking. Well, I'm I'm currently. I just did the Wonderland thing, and to expand on, you know what you're talking about what happens because of these big big returns that everybody's getting what happens when it gets too big and they have to start you know they can't go on forever can you expand on what potentially happens at a point where they just can't keep paying out these insane gains like where does it go from there sure so the, the really important thing to understand with these crazy returns because they seem unbelievable is that there's a reason why it's there, right? And if you look at what it was, like we saw 60,000% APY earlier this year, like six months ago, um, and, and it's gone down significantly since then. Why? Not because the project is bad, but it's because they've already built out their treasury big time. And so they don't really need a whole lot of more liquidity in order to achieve what they want to do. And so the the every APY, every yield, is basically an incentive to bring liquidity in and once things start to get to where they need to, that's proportionately the mm -hmm. yields start to go down too. Okay, so like eventually in a few years, um, I'm hoping more like five years, but in the next few years, we're going to start to see returns in this world kind of be similar to what we see in the traditional finance world. And so, and, and what that means is you're going to see maybe instead of, you know, 7,000%, you're going to see more like 5%, 10%, right? Um, and that's just a matter of all of the liquidity being converted to being a crypto native asset or crypto native equivalent. And so, you know, that's why I say like, you know, you, the most important thing that you can do is be early in anything and furthermore to hold, right? Because time in the market will always be timing the market. I had a question for uh, Blue Collar um, about just kind of your thought process on why you got into Wonderland. Uh, today, et cetera. Like, what, what kind of, what was your goal? What was your thought process? What are you hoping to get from it? What are you hoping to earn? And also, like, well, well, you know, what did you do to get into it? Um, just kind of curious because I've heard a lot about that project. So basically, I, I think it was on one of the live chats. I heard um, Pax and um, Pax and Damien kind of speaking about, uh, about it and linked uh, the Discord. So it was always on the radar. And then just personally. Um, Excuse me one second. Just give me one second. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, and me personally, I have a problem with procrastination. So um, 
the way my mind works is uh, it's always going from one thing to the next thing and trying to do the best thing. And, you know, that me personally, I just have a problem with procrastination. Either I'm all in and my mind changes all the time or I just don't do anything. So I just decided that today it was a good day. And, you know, that that's re the reason why it was today. I mean, I, I really should have had a, done a little bit more research, but, you know, at sooner, sooner or later, I was going to have to make a move. So, you know, Call it a little bit un uneducated, but at least now I'm learning by doing. And uh, to get in, it really wasn't that difficult. I mean, uh, I'm basically, I call myself a caveman all the time because I'm really not tech savvy at all. I'm learning as I go. Um, it's just moving things around. Basically, you get AVAX on a Avalanche, uh, an Avalanche network on MetaMask. And then you're basically, um, you're buying uh, AVAX and uh, converting it to time um you're converting it to time and then oh you're converting it to time and then you can stake the time on wonderland's website basically and then once you stake that it turns into what's called a memo or uh, memories or I, i'm not really really sure what it is but it's not really that hard and then you could also use their Discord. There's a lot of people there that really like walk you through it. They're pretty cool. Just watch out for the scammers because as soon as I ask the question, they would directly DM me trying to quote unquote help. And you knew right off the bat, but maybe you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't know, but there are a lot of scammers out there too. So that's basically, you know, my thought process on it. And I put, originally I put 250 in and then this morning, you know, I was going over the numbers, this calculators and stuff like that. Oh, no, I put 500 in, and that was going to be like $40 a week at the current way the market was going. And, you know, I have, you know, enough money that, you know, a couple grand wasn't going to make or break me either way. And the way the, the market is right now, I was running the numbers, and I saw that, you know, I can get my initial investment back out within like 38 to 40 days. So if it was three grand, and I could get the three grand, you know, in that amount of time, uh, I'm playing the odds. and. Now I'm at the juncture where um, I wait the 38, 40 days. If I have the three grand, do I actually pull it out or just let it ride and go on? So that's basically uh, my thought process on it. Got it. So you're you're kind of expecting to uh, get what what yield rate and how long do you think you're going to have to lock it up for to get that? Uh, to be honest, I didn't go too far in it. Math, again, is not one of my strong, strong points, but, uh, rough numbers, uh, that I went over, uh, I think if it just stays the way it is right now and I leave the money alone and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, if I leave it without taking the three grand out in seven months, I'll have a hundred grand uh, of the three grand. And if that's keeping it the way the, at the rate it's, um, going right now and if i take the initial three grand out after 40 days it would take nine months to get to that hundred grand and i'm not sure if that is true or not but th between the calculators and math people i know that i spoke to said that th that's pretty close so uh, maybe somebody else can expand on that if uh you know i don't know no so you're right i mean yeah. holding the the yield at what it is today surely it will grow to that point but as more people throw more liquidity in there, it will reduce. So you'll have to do a little more complex math to calculate exactly what it is, but the rate at which it will grow is certainly up um, as this whole space grows to be more popular. Um, but hypothetically, yes, yeah, Setters Paribus, uh, it will grow th to that, but I would probably say, you know, have some uh, deviation from that. Um, I would say like as much as 50%, which is really not <laughs> really bad at all. No, uh, but again, it is, which is really highly, it's all highly dependent on uh, how much at, and the rate at which uh, people throw money in there. So the less people that get into this, the greater your yield, the more people that get into it, the lower your yield. So that's one of the places, and that's why a lot of people don't talk about it, you know, because it, it's like you don't want people to be reducing your yield, right? And so it's kind right. of one of the best yeah. kept secrets uh, of the whole space, that, that project and, and everything, every Olympus fork for that matter. So, so is it you... sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Is it advantageous? Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be more and more popping up. Is it advantageous to be always shopping around for the next new thing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, anything that's new and as long as it's safe to use, 
Um, definitely. And, and, and that's kind of the thing, right? I mean, that's why there's a lot of forks going on right now. And, and some of them are going to be scams. So you always want to have, uh, you always want to vet them. You always want to talk with other people, how long they've been in them, check out the team and all that good stuff. Because of course, there's always somebody willing who won't really wants to part you from your hard earned assets. Um, but with a little homework and some validation from others, you can always make sure you're getting into the right projects again, as early as possible, because that's how you're going to maximize your returns. I was just going to ask, uh, for people who have been in DeFi for a while now, uh, would you think that taking profits would be better than just leaving it all there for the one year, let's say with Wonderland time, cause it's compounding interest, right? So if you take out some profits, you're pretty much starting from, let's say like a fraction of where you already were. So, yeah. So I generally, that's why I, the power of compound interest is insane. So I generally never take anything out um, right. and I leave everything in for as long as possible. And, and I mean, that's the name of the game, you know, HODL, let, <laughs> let things sit, <laughs> let them run, and they're going to grow far more quickly than, and than you ever imagined. And so, yeah, that's exactly right. Once you throw it in there, ideally leave it, just leave it in there and you'll be amazed at where it's at in a year or two. And, and I was just going to ask, because we are entering a bear market after this cycle, right? It's just like the pattern of how the market works. How well, much generally, would that yeah. Go oh, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to ask how much would that affect, let's say, DAOs. And because they are trying to be a reserve currency, right? They're trying to make it that in a way that uh, even though it does go down to a bear market, it doesn't get as affected as a normal cryptocurrency. Is that like the right mindset that I'm thinking? Yeah, yeah. So actually, so with the way that Olympus is mechanically designed, um, in the in, in the um, in a situation that people start to withdraw their money, the yield is actually going to go up. So that's why right now in a bull market, you know, you want to start before the bull market starts. Ideally, right, you want to get into projects that way you can ride them all out, and then you want to convert things that you win from the, the all the profits that you make in the bull market. You want to throw into the in, during the bear market into projects like Olympus. Because as people take money out of the system, your yield is actually going to go up. So mm -hmm. in the time that everyone doubts, if you still believe you have your conviction, you will actually be rewarded for that. And so, you know, you never want to, <laughs> it's like a, the market, there's a really good saying, the market is where money goes from the impatient to the patient, right? And so in that sense, yeah, in, the, in a bear market, Olympus will do really well. Uh, time as an asset is going to do very well. And, and you can go ahead and watch the yields too. You'll see how they work, but always uh, keep an eye on that TVL and how it relates to the APY. And uh, you'll see how exactly what I'm saying kind of uh, manifests itself. Hey, Damon, could you just touch on briefly? I know it's probably gonna go over, well, it'll go over my head too, but I've, I've known now that I'm in Wonderland. Can you touch on what minting is in that space because I know what minting is. Oh, I kind of know what minting is in terms of NFT. But uh, can you touch on what minting is in uh, like a space like Wonderland? That's actually a really good question. I'd like to learn more about that too. Sure. Yeah. So in, in the context of whether it's so minting is just the creation of something, right? On Ethereum, a token in particular. And so what's important to understand is that an NFT or even because that's an ERC seven twenty one token. So it's non-fungible, it's unique. And an ERC-20 is just one that is fungible, right? One ETH is not any different from another ETH. However, one NFT absolutely is different from another NFT. And so minting is just basically the, the creation or the genesis, right? The birth of either a new token, whether it's an ERC-20 or an ERC-721. And then there's also on the flip side, something called burning, right? And that's ultimately just the, the destruction or rather the removal of that particular token from the supply so uh, ultimately like that's why you'll even when you jump into certain discords and telegram groups you'll hear people say hey is there going to be a token burning event right because when there's a token burning event there are tokens being removed from the supply which means that the supply is more scarce right and greater scarcity means greater value so long as demand also follows it and so that's that's what minting is. Minting is just the creation of something, and minting is the removal or the destruction of it is a good way to think about it. And so with regard to NFTs, when you mint an NFT, 
that means you're the, the very first person to interface with the smart contract and to instantiate that particular NFT. Uh, you're minting it, you're, you're making it for the first time. And then it can be created or traded thereafter. And in some really interesting NFT projects, there are some NFTs that are even burnt, right? And so when NFTs, which are already unique um, in their own supply world, if they're removed, then every other NFT is even more rare. Not only is it unique, but it's also more scarce. And so that's why NFTs, <laughs> whenever there's like a burning mechanism um, written into the contract, those are some of the most interesting to me because they're deflationary, right? Rather than like inflationary, like a standard money supply, like the like the dollar and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of the whole context for minting and burning. I hope that was clear. Let me know if it wasn't, or if you guys have more questions. For no, us. no, definitely, that was that was very clear as far as that goes. Um, I'm I see in like the, I guess DAOs you call them. Uh, that people are minting their own tokens. That's something that you could do. I mean, I understand the thought process behind it because you explained it very, very well. But is it advantageous to to mint your own tokens if I'm getting that right? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Like that's what we're going to be doing here with Xerox Alpha where we're going to have our own DAO, right? And so, it, so the best way to think of a DAO is, and this is what I do with everything in, in this space, right? We already have a whole universe that we've created for civilization, right? We have we have banks, we have uh, like stores, we have companies, right? Legal entities and whatnot. And so what a DAO is, is basically the crypto native equivalent of what a company is, right? But it's interesting yeah. because there's no CEO, right? There's no CEO of a DAO. A DAO is its own CEO. And everyone else that is a part of that DAO is an equal member. Okay, and so with uh, when you're a part of a DAO, you get tokens, right? Tokens represent ownership. And what are tokens? They're basically the crypto native equivalent of what a stock is, right? It's a sh it's a class A equivalent. Or, I'm sorry, it's the equivalent of a class A share in traditional finance because with each token you get governance, the same way that you get voting power when you hold class A shares of a company. So when you have a lot of tokens and you're part of a DAO. And then there are proposals are like, hey, guys, you know, like a DAO has a treasury, right? That's the same thing as a balance sheet in traditional finance. We have, you know, 1 million, 10 million, whatever billion dollars. What should we do with it? Rather than having the CEO and the, and the C-suite coming up with all of these decisions and then telling every other employee what to do, instead, a DAO, everyone is in the, in the C-suite. But how much voting power they have with what the DAO does with its money is all determined by how many tokens you have. And so that's why when a DAO, like there, I'm a member of a, a couple. And so we, we've sold a lot of like um, a lot of different assets, whether they are you know, physical products that are NFTs themselves or NFTs that are digital. Um, there's money that goes into a treasury and everybody benefits from that because it's like, hey, guys, OK, we have a million dollars, two million dollars in, in the treasury. And ultimately, that treasury then creates value for the token holders, because now you can do stuff together with that money and move as one entity in a decentralized manner. And so that's that's kind of the benefit of, or that is the benefit of a DAO and, what, and that is the utility of the token. You get to have a say with what everyone does in the DAO and with the DAO's money. And so it, it's a completely new uh, legal entity. It's even been recognized as uh, a legal ent entity. And you can go to Wyoming, and you can start one. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And I'm really excited to get moving on that for everyone. And, you know, generally the way it works is any early members of the DAO get um, specific allocations and they get it airdropped. You don't have to pay for it. You're just automatically given a certain portion. And as we all grow, everybody wins. And so that's the really cool thing. And I think that's the way you can spread wealth and and make people feel like they're part of something and and have voting and have a say at the table. And it's just so much cooler than, you know, because there are some things like when you're part of a regular company and the CEO does something stupid, you know, and you disagree with it. I mean, employees leave, right? But now, like, you basically have this new legal structure where every member can vote on what's best. And it's all about consensus, right? And that's, that's <laughs> you know, Ethereum itself is built on consensus, right? Like, if I send you X amount of ETH, 
every validator, every every node needs to agree that that happened. And in that same way, it's like when you're a member of a DAO, everybody is a node, and everybody has to agree on what goes, uh, what happens thereafter. And so um, that's that's kind of a, a rundown on DAOs and and their tokens and and how there's value accrual in them. I hope that answered the question. That's that's actually the most amazing explanation I ever heard. And now you just took me to another level where I'm always thinking of the tokens and these specific, like, cause I think in my limited brain, these tokens represent currencies and there's a million different currencies and it's never going to work. But you, the way you're explaining it is it's not a currency and it's not a, it's not anything like that. It's a stake. Basically it's a stake in whatever entity or DAO you're a part of. It's like a voting right or something like that. It's not actually currency. Exactly. Yes. And so yeah, that's what's so that's interesting crazy. about, isn't it? I, that's, I was yeah, so that's amazed awesome. that's, when I started to, my mind. <laughs> when I started understanding that I was like, oh my God, like this is the future, right? Because instead of things happening top down, because there could be a lot of disagreement there. Now everything's happens in a decentralized manner. Everybody can say, and well, everybody has to agree on it. And so you're, you're always making the best decisions because they're like a bad decision it just won't go through you know like everybody has to agree yes that is a good decision and so ultimately everything is forced to be a meritocracy and only only the cool things happen in the world going forward and so that's that itself that in and of itself unlocks a whole new level of efficiency in the form of capital control and so yeah you're also you're also um well, you look at what's going on in the world, well, at least in America, how there's a power struggle between the ultra wealthy and this power control and everybody's saying, uh, you know, the CEO or the owner and, you know, I'm a capitalist by nature, so I'm not a tax the rich type person. But you have all these other people on the other side of the aisle that say, you know, we should have control, the workers should have control. And this is like bridging the gap and basically making every, you know, could be good for everybody. And, and so to speak, it's, it's actually exactly. really hard. It's wild. Exactly. Yes. And so that's why governance tokens, I mean, for the longest time, and even some people who have been in crypto for a while say, oh, that's just a useless governance token. And it's like, well, I mean, you have to understand a governance token is just a, a completely new capital instrument that when utilized properly and as it is supposed to be, you can really, really start to make a difference because now you have the collective decisions of a DAO being made in the best manner that benefits everyone. That's world changing. That really is, you know. It really is. And and so the way that I see it playing out in it just and I'm glad you brought it up with regard to in the context of like uh like a nation state, right? Like the US. Right. As of right now, of course, you have the, you know, the ultra wealthy who basically have the most control of the entire world because they also have a lot of influence over politicians and the people making the decisions and these politicians ultimately end up having only their private interests in mind because why because they're compensated in the form of like they get their uh their campaigns funded Maybe. by these companies yeah exactly it's all you know you scratch each other's backs and and you win in that way like i personally think it should be illegal for politicians to be able to hold capital i'm sorry um to hold shares in a company because then they become vested in the success of that company and sometimes the success of that company is not in the, the benefit or in the in favor of the entire collective society. Yeah, that make, that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. Because I'm, you know, not, not that, you know, I was ever wealthy or successful, but I've been always I've been my whole life just climbing the ladder to one day be that guy. Um, and inherently, you know, I, you know, looking out, I, you know, like a Jeff Bezos or something like that. I don't think we should tax them to death at all but we are a part of a broken system you know so if there is a whole new thing which this thing looks like it is and people and it's been adopted it could just force a whole new way of doing business in general exactly and the way that i see it beginning and it already has started on a very very small level and it's kind of you know in the kind of corner of everything and, and it hasn't really come out so like right now the metaverse and gaming is the, the big thing that everyone's talking about and that's because it's very it's fun and engaging right and easy to understand especially like with microtransactions and all that good stuff and being able to take your nfts from one metaverse to the next yeah, that's I, well that's what I, I don't think people have really understood that quite yet at, at you know in mass but it's going to come in i believe the next three to six months 
which is why I'm extremely bullish on NFTs and the metaverse um, for now. But then once that kind of is in, has woven itself into our social fabric, the next thing that's going to happen is governance really, really uh, happening at large. And so what I mean by that is that like a city, right? Imagine you've lived in uh, Dreamville for, you know, 10 years and you've paid a lot in taxes. But you don't necessarily have any say in how the city kind of conducts itself with its money, right? And you can go to, you know, meetings and the council and you can kind of have some say. But what if now you can actually have dream tokens, right? And so with those tokens, you can now vote on what that city does with its money. And it's going to be reflective of how long you've been in the community. And so that once we have that sort of governance, it's going to happen in cities first and then counties and then states, and then countries, and in the future, even the whole world. Where now we're making, I mean, that's what like the uh, like the, the UN is, right? United Nations, they're supposed to be making the best decisions for all of the countries, but even that, sometimes they don't make the best decisions. And there's all kinds of, like, for example, look what happened with uh, Trump and, uh, you know, the, the, like the, what was it, the Paris Agreement, where you supposed to reduce carbon emissions and things like that. And, you know, that was a private decision made by by basically his administration. But imagine if everyone in the whole world had a say in what their country should be doing and ultimately what the world should be doing at large. Now you're going to have a whole new form of governance that has never been seen before. And it's all going to be in the interest and voted by the entire civilization as we know it. And so... I mean, a, a, when you really zoom out, it is it is absolutely undeniably the future. And that's something for which I'm extremely excited. So question, um, question. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, Damien, uh, you know, the majority of, uh, you know, the, the, the DAO holders who has the most tokens has like the more the, the more leverage uh, on what to vote on. So how do you like balance that out throughout the whole? you know, throughout the whole, um, the whole DAO system or the, the yeah, DAO no, that's holders. a, that's a really good question because if we don't do this right, we can end up in a world where only the whales, right? The people with the most tokens end up having basically total control of everything. And we almost fall in the same, uh, space that we are in now. Right. And so there are mechanisms being experimented with and a couple of projects, they haven't even started using it yet. This is like extremely novel. But where there's a um, like a, a, a function that uses randomness to distribute tokens, and also when it comes to proposals, who cares if the guy with the most uh, makes one vote? There can suddenly be uh, more power given to someone who has the least, right? Mm -hmm. Or just r r randomly, like let's say, okay, we're going to randomly pull, you know, these thousand or these hundred thousand or these million wallets and just double their governance power triple, whatever, quadruple. And in that way, you can distribute that capital control in a way that is random, but ultimately that's far better than strictly being uh, restri um, uh, like restricted to only those with the most. And so that's where, and, and that's still being experimented with. Now that's just one example in which uh, they can actually, actually implement that. But the best way is probably to just randomly distribute additional tokens uh, to some of the the holders uh, with less, um, and ultimately, you know, if someone wants to sell them, then they can, right? Um, but I would say, when it comes to governance tokens, holding them is going to be the best because voting power of something that is powerful is uh, even more valuable than short term gains of of money. And so, you know, it's it's going to take a lot of education, um, which is why I say it's going to be a few years before that happens. But I think once everyone understands, oh, the more tokens I have, the more voting power I have, everyone's going to really start to hodl <laughs> their their governance token. Be a lot of value accrual in a lot of different ways, and there will be a lot, a lot of tokens out there, and some of which will be highly valued by people, and some of which won't be valued at all. Right? Like, for example, like at some random city in Milwaukee. You know, I'm out here in California. I won't care about that. But all of the people in Milwaukee, in that particular city, will want those governance tokens. Or if you're going to move into that city, you're going to want to buy some of the gov those governance tokens. Because as a newcomer, you won't have as many as, say, someone who's lived there for 10 years and whatnot, right? And so there are going to be a lot of, lot of airdrops coming out in the future where your governance power is going to be reflective of how long you've been a member of that community. 
and uh, that's super cool. And, and which and which projects are are out currently right now that are that are doing that? Uh, so one that's experimenting with it, of which I'm a member, um, is the Alchemics community. Uh, they haven't implemented it yet, but they will. Produce Because the guy who founded uh, Alchemics is actually a really, really cool guy um, and is extremely democratic and interested in making things as fair as possible, which is why he's also just designed it in such a way where even if you deposit and you want to pull it out, like you can do that at any time um, without taking on any risk. So it, just the, the, the function of Alchemics as a tool is very promising for anybody who wants to save money uh, and draw value from it over time. And while also pr providing uh, governance um, in a very fair manner. So holding Alchemix token is a really great idea, in my opinion, uh, because you'll be able to have a say with how they direct themselves in the future. And, and that goes for every project, right? I mean, every every token is a governance token. Um, and so, you know, that's voting power is basically being quantified. The value of that voting power is being quantified in the form of a token and its price. And so once people start to realize uh, the power that's going to come with that, we're going to see some really interesting price action on a lot of these tokens. For example, like Maker, right? MakerDAO has its token Maker. Uh, and it's really incredibly valuable because people want to say what happens with Maker. Same thing with Alchemix. I mean, Alchemix hit like 1,500 earlier this year. I think it's around three, 400 last time I checked. Um, but to be able to vote on what's happening there, and for example, let's say they have a, uh, a proposal to distribute fees out to all of the holders. If you're a large holder of that token, you're going to vote yes. And you're going to want to hope that you have a lot of governance power in order to make that happen. And so that basically goes for every project, because ultimately what those those that fee distribution is in equivalent to in, in the if you equate it to what's happening in traditional finance, they're like dividends. Uh, but they're probably going to be a lot juicier than what dividends are today, because the Dow doesn't have to pay for a bunch of employees and their benefits and whatnot. Instead. It only has to sustain itself, which is costs practically nothing because it's already on Ethereum operating uh, autonomously. So what? What I want to know about the project is like uh, I'm I'm not really clear on uh, what's exactly like. For example, there's a new project right now, and everybody are uh, buying some stable coins and. Uh, like uh, investing in that project, like that means that the 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 money is going into the treasury. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, like with Ohm, right? The the value, the the uh, money that you buy goes into the treasury. Exactly. Yeah. So when they, so everybody is staking this this like their stash, they their bag, and like I'm not really sure on what's actually like. Where does the 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 tokens that are minting like where are they coming from? That like that's like embedded in the economics of the of the contract or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so as you throw more money in, uh, Ohm is minted for you to own essentially. So that's uh, in in theory that's only lasting until every token is minted. Well, there's no cap supply on Ohm. Right, similar to how there's no cap supply on the dollar. So that's how that works. Hmm. So the next heart. No, go ahead. Yeah. I'm like. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You can go ahead. Yeah, the thing is that uh, I guess what I'm not understanding at that point is uh, like. If they have unlimited supply and the tokens are constantly minting, um, I guess in my mind that's kind of creating value out of thin air, but I guess there is something that's like uh, some something that's backing that up. Like, right. You and that's your deposit. So your deposit backs every own. And so the value that is going in is coming out just in a different form. Okay, 
but uh, if everybody takes their tokens out, then nothing would be like there's no tokens that are min minting at that point cannot happen, right? Right, right. And so what you're describing is something that every bank has to deal with, every every reserve, and and what it's called a bank run, right? And that's what happened with a project that failed this year was the with Iron Finance with their uh, Titan, I forget the pair off the top of my head, um, Iron and Titan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, everybody started withdrawing their money. And so the doll, it crashed because there was no more value to back uh, every stable coin that they had been issuing. And so everything is dependent on people putting money into that reserve and then leaving it there. And how do they incentivize that? Well, with these yields that you're seeing. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. There needs to be people throwing money in and leaving it there for the value to be there. And, and the yield is used to, to encourage that and to also retain that value. Because okay. if people start taking their money out, the yield is going to go up, which would incentivize other people to bring their money into that system. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in theory, what I actually wanted to know is, so everybody, for example, everybody took their money out of the, the project and at that point minting still happens but the minted token doesn't have any value right well so when you redeem it there's actually own burnt sorry can you repeat that so so if you pull your money out there's actually own being burned so that way you don't have like this infinite supply uh, that was initially produced so that that's basically how that controls itself And it's not many. It's not really any different from traditional finance, right? Like the Federal Reserve, when they buy bonds from like the banks, like retail banks, uh, essentially what they're doing is infusing cash into the system. Inversely, if they sell bonds, uh, they're basically taking money out of the system, right? And so that's basically the equivalent function of this whole minting and burning process. And so last year we had a whole lot of cash flowing into the system which ultimately devalued the currency, but the Federal Reserve didn't actually have more money to back it, right? I mean, there were a lot of other countries that bought our bonds and that's how they were able to have, and that kind of, that backed it, uh, but it wasn't as much as what they minted essentially. <laughs> so it, that's why when you have arbitrary control, like when you have just a bunch of people arbitrarily determining how much money should be thrown into the system, you can end up with like hyperinflation. Whereas when you have things being governed programmatically, algorithmically you can prevent that sort of thing from happening because it's not up to just some dude in, in a in an office to come up with how much should be made it's instead governed by the smart contract to do it in such a way that it is equitable and, and retains value for everyone involved yeah thank you for that like that explains it well like the thing is that uh, i guess i'm not I, n I never actually had interest in uh, like how economy works and stuff like that. So this whole thing is just like, <laughs> I have to learn the whole thing from the beginning. No, absolutely. I mean, this is something like bonds and all like treasury bills, all that stuff, like hardly, it's, it's, it can be kind of boring, you know, like unless you have a particular interest in it yourself um, because it is kind of dry, but it, you know, having studied economics, I just thought it was the coolest thing. Cause it's like, oh my God, like, I mean, hardly anybody even asks themselves like, what is money? Right? How is it made? Um, but that was always something because ultimately, it, you know, being fiat, right, being federally issued, uh, and then just being said, yeah, this is one dollar, guys, and you can trade stuff with it. You know, um, I was just like, hold on, how, how does that actually work? Because like the barter system works exactly like perfectly, right? It's like if you have two chickens, I have a pig, and you know, you want a pig, and I want two chickens, then we make that trade. But instead, like we can use this unit of account; they can buy anything. Um, then that makes that removes a lot of friction from it, everything, right? All of commerce. And so I just wanted to know, I've always wanted to know how all of that works. And, and that's why I studied economics and, and had a lot of fun with it. But yeah, very, very few people uh, have their head wrapped around it because it's just, you know, money's just there and it buys stuff and it works. And that's kind of the idea. You know, you don't need everybody to understand how it works. Uh, you just need everyone to be able to use it and enjoy it. So yeah, no shame in, in not understanding all of this this boring stuff, to be honest.
but yeah, I hope uh, everything's been pretty clear for everyone. And, and if you have any questions, please feel free. I, I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, it's very, very, very interesting about the the DAO, man. Um, so essentially, you can have a, you can create a DAO of, let's say, of, a, of an, an investing DAO, and there's, let's say, uh, you know, five individuals that throws in, you know, a million dollars each in that DAO, and then you guys could, you know, direct uh, towards uh, an investment opportunity, and then, and then, uh, you know, you guys invest in in that opportunity, and then the profits. Uh, generated out of that investment could be uh you know split up in that uh in, in the DAO the people that invested in that DAO right exactly yes exactly and so that's what I want to do here too wherein let's say let's use that example right where there are five people and they each throw a million dollars and so then they throw the five million dollars into the DAO into the treasury and in return let's say there are five million tokens minted right to represent every dollar and so now what the DAO can do is direct that money into different investments, right? And obviously that would be in other tokens. And as the value of that treasury grows, right, their portfolio, everybody who initially invested has a right to claim some of that value in direct proportion to their initial contribution. So that would mean if it goes from $5 million to $100 million, well, now everybody has a right to take out $20 million. And also the voting is split equally in five ways. Now, where it gets really interesting is, let's say, you know, one of the guys ends up thinking, or one of the people thinks that, oh, you know what, I, I don't believe in these investments anymore. I'm going to sell my governance tokens. And let's say it's at a premium. Let's say, okay, it was initially a dollar for every token, but it's done a little well, but I don't believe it's going to go any further. And so that the value of their token will be in direct respect to how much the the treasury has grown. And so they go from $1 million to $2 million and they sell that. Now they've doubled their money and they're happy, but let's say they sell it to like a hundred different people, right? And so now the claim on all of that money is not just split between five people, but it's split between 104 people. And everybody has the can make uh, has governance power in direct proportion to the total circulating supply of that governance token. And so you can imagine zooming out and that at scale being super interesting for hedge funds and whatnot um, to go ahead and, and uh, basically take that on and, and distribute governance control and, and capital in ways that we haven't been able to do before. <laughs> That is that is, that is beautiful, man. Wow, wow. Okay, and, and you and you can make and you can make uh the tokens deflationary, right? To so make make it uh scarce. I mean, sure. Um, you you could do something like that if someone wants to burn uh some of their governance, they can, which makes the the supply even more scarce. But they would basically uh be saying goodbye to whatever claim uh those tokens had at that time, and and the value would be distributed. Uh, to each token uh, respectively. So that would, yes, that would uh, increase the value of each governance token uh, because of the increased scarcity. And, and that would be like a really interesting uh, design to have. Because now it's harder to have control of all of those funds because there's fewer tokens floating around. Interesting. Man. Does that make sense for everyone? No, yeah, you explained it like beautifully like thank you so much for this it's so helpful sure yeah 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 it really is You're explaining it so well thank you of course no i'm happy to share i mean this is this is the vision this is this is crypto welcome <laughs> yeah it's really really cool i'm just at work so i can't really talk yeah yeah no it's not all just a bunch of jpegs and, and digital beans you guys it's far more than that <laughs> the, but the, the the thing is that people don't uh, like can't get to the right information in this space. That's the, that what I know. This is the hardest thing. Like you have to go really deep, uh, like in some like groups like this, just to find out like some basic stuff. And uh, and there is also so much of it. So people like like can't learn it all. Like you just need 
a lot of time to 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 swallow this whole thing like it's a it's a huge space that you just have to grind and teach like little by little yeah exactly and and that's why i want to i've started this group because i really you know i've spent a lot i've spent years learning all of this stuff and, I, and i've been in it for a really long time and so i've essentially pre-chewed a lot of this stuff and i want to just wrap it up in a nice little box and, and give it out to as many people as possible because ultimately that is going to benefit all of society and and our entire species and civilization as a whole and and that's really what we're moving toward and, and anything that i can do to make that happen faster is a win for everybody and to sit back and when we're living in that future and to know to go to sleep at night knowing that i've helped uh, make it happen even just a little bit uh, just puts a smile on my face. So that's incredible. Great. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate you guys, and, and I'm happy to to share. And, and you know, because ultimately, yeah, it makes every everyone wins. There's literally there's nobody that loses. You know, the only people who lose are the people who can't get in. And and that's why I think it's important to bring everyone in, especially early. Your family, your friends, your loved ones. You know, all that. And and then for them to do the same once they understand it, there's there's no way anyone can lose. Yeah. So in in that sense, it's uh, like it's uh, representing like a big uh, threat, like to the current uh, like governments and stuff. So yeah. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, uh, how do you think the, that's that 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 whole thing is gonna play out? Because I'm sure they're gonna fight back. Like. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And I've thought a lot about that. Um, ultimately, it's inevitable. This is the future, whether they like it or not. Once everyone realizes that they will actually be better off and have more power, and you know, the beautiful thing about Ethereum and the way that it's been designed is in such a way that it they it can't be stopped. Like anybody who says, "Oh yeah," they're you know, when I hear, "Oh, they're going to illegalize it," you know, <laughs> like I just I kind of smile and laugh because it's like, well, like you just don't understand how it works yet. Um, but like that's just not possible, right? I mean, I think, and personally, I think Bitcoin is under threat because of this whole environmental thing, right? Where they're saying, "Oh, if you're mining, you have to register with us um, so that you um, uh, we have you on paper, basically, right?" And then at that point, now you've revealed your address, you've revealed your location, and if the government wants, they can shut you down or they can take control, right? And so that's another reason why Ethereum wanted to move away from proof of work so that they wouldn't have the environmental implication that Bitcoin does. And they wouldn't have to register under that sort of system. And instead, if you're a miner for Ethereum or a node or a validator uh, and you have a lot of governance power, now, because you're not, quote unquote, destroying the environment, you don't need to register with a centralized government or anything like that. And you can stay under the radar and keep this system working in such a way that no one person or entity has too much control and you can continue to give power and spread it out to everyone. And that's the whole vision here that everybody can win um, and that there aren't any, um, you know, people doing things that are only serve their interest and instead everyone can vote for what's best for them. That would be the dream. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is the dream, and and that's it's happening. You know, I'm far faster than I thought possible because of NFTs. Uh, you know, it's like I thought. You know, I was gonna have to wait 20, 30 years for this kind of stuff to happen. I didn't think NFTs were gonna be a big thing for another five years, but like, look at where it's gone in in a year. Uh, you know, even in 2019, 2018, nobody knew what this stuff was, and now you have Snoop Dogg and all kinds of celebrities aping into NFTs and and DAO projects and whatnot because. They, they see the future and it all happens one by one. And with the sort of influence that, you know, a lot of big people have, like, I, I just see this space growing uh, exponentially. And uh, whether the government likes it or not, like, crypto is coming and there's nothing they can do to stop it. Um, Bitcoin, you know, there's a smart contract platform running on it. But because of that threat that I mentioned, I, I don't really see Bitcoin being the ultimate currency. I see it as kind of just being the new gold, which is valuable in and of itself, but potentially uh, ha under the control of the government. Whereas Ethereum, you know, there's just no way. And also the community of Ethereum is just a lot more, a lot less willing to let that happen. And I mean, if you talk to some of the people who have been in Ethereum for a really long time, such as myself, like we are all gung-ho on the philosophy that drives it. And there's whatever we can do to prevent uh, capital control, you know, we're going to make it happen.
So what do you think about China? They seem like they're trying to get ahead of the crypto game. Yeah, so it, with China, it's pretty interesting because what they're doing is not, they're definitely not distributing covered in tokens, I can tell you that. Um, but what they are doing is upgrading their financial if, infrastructure, right, in the form of a CBDC, a central bank issued digital currency. And, and the reason why they're doing it is because they want to be able to track where every quote unquote dollar goes, right, which I think the government should do too. I, I don't think CBDCs are a bad idea and they certainly don't. I think it's it just shows how little people understand this whole space when they say, oh, CBDCs threaten Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. It's like, no, it doesn't. All, it's just a, the digitization of money that has needed to be around for a really long time. Like if the, do, if the government creates a dollar, like hell yeah, they should be able to track wherever it goes, which wallet it goes to, to whom it belongs. Because what that's going to do is discourage a whole lot of illegal activity from happening. And you're going to be able to track taxes a lot better. And, you know, Anybody in this space doesn't like taxes, of course, but at the end of the day, taxes are the cost of civilization and control and not control, but order, right? Like we need police, we need laws to prevent people from doing bad things. And we need roads and we need infrastructure like that. And so as a collective we, civilization and, and societies, and as a, a network of collective societies, we need to be able to pay people to do that sort of thing and to fund it all. Because imagine, you know, if a, if a city has no taxes, they can't sustain their parks and therefore the public good that is the park goes away. And so that's something that definitely needs to be maintained. And, and there's a lot of good that taxes do. I mean, of course, right now, how some of those funds are allocated, of course, a lot of people don't agree with. And, and I'm in that same boat because right now there is no form of distributed governance where, wherein people can have their say, right? Instead, we just are forced to pay these taxes, whether we like it or not, and they do whatever they they want with it that may or may not be in our best interests. But with governance tokens being distributed to everybody, ultimately the treasury that the government holds will be, will be allocated in such a way that is in the best interest of in the entire collective society. And so, yeah, just another reason why I'm super bullish on that and why I don't think CBDCs are a bad thing at all. And, and that's that's the only reason China's doing it. It's, it's ultimately a, a really good way. And they're doing it super well, actually, like with... You know, they have, a, what is it, um, like WeChat and WePay and, and all these digital services that really uh, have like a great uh, interoperable sort of ecosystem um, and with which they're actually building right on top of. So everybody being digital in, in China and using digital money is only actually going to improve uh, their society and also help the government with controlling uh, where all the money goes and making sure that it all works in the best interest of the well right now they're a little centralized so of course their their desires but in the future it with the inevitable rise of, of distributed governance tokens they're going to have to to flip on that in the future otherwise people will revolt and it's just going to be a whole mess and you know through revolts that's how change happens you know so uh i'm super excited uh for all that to happen yeah so essentially you see um China becoming more decentralized sort of from within yeah I think it's gonna I think China will probably it'll take a lot longer um because you know they do a lot of blocking and they have a lot of propaganda but yeah essentially they're just digitizing their money and they want to be able to track every dollar um which is good in the short run but in the long run um you know a lot of the really cool good stuff is going to happen yeah um and just with the whole tax thing, like something that just started this month where I live is they've put on cameras everywhere on the highways to catch anyone using their phone. And you can, like for road safety, but you can guarantee not a single dollar is going to go to actually improving the roads for safety. Right, right, exactly. And so, like, that's an interesting uh, situation, right? Like, any money, any fines that are derived from traffic tickets and whatnot should only be allocated to uh, improving the infrastructure uh, upon which they, they are uh, surveilling, right? Um, and, and we're gonna be able to track all of that in the future, but right now, obviously that's just internally held by their government. But yeah, no, I mean, that, that's a really good uh, point. But yeah, no, that was uh, all good questions, you guys. Hey, Damien, would you say it's a good thing that China banned 
most of the all, all of the miners and uh, the hash power is coming out of us now and um, i think what is it i think a third of the uh, of bitcoin is now being mined in the us would you say it's helped to um, that little i guess bear market we had uh, in uh, in may that started until may uh, from may until july or august that it kind of helped to prolong the cycle and um, i think in general would you say it was a good thing that now i guess we are less dependent on china and any of the fud um to come out from china yeah absolutely so i think it's ultimately good for miners to be getting out of china just because china's kind of crazy um <laughs> with their their form of capital control but um the only fear that i have there is with it and with a lot of it being in the us is as, like as mentioned like with them having to register with the esg the environmental agency like or, or like coalition um you know with things basically becoming centralized which is against the entire philosophy of it and and the thing is right there's a lot of people who only get into this game for money and, and don't have uh any idea of the philosophy and everything that's going on and that's my only fear so it's it's kind of a double-edged sword like yes it's good for to be out of china um but on the other side it's bad for it whether it's in any country there should never be a concentration of hashing power in one place because then it's subject to that centralization and so it's just one more like risk vector uh for the ecosystem as a whole so you're saying it's not that good that then in the us because obviously us is uh, doing all those crazy things like um trying to um impose a tax on unrealized gains and basically i guess i'm not saying that gary gensler and uh jerome paulo trying to destroy cryptocurrency but in some ways i guess um they're trying to regulate it right so what you said about Bitcoin, that's, um, well, why Ethereum, why you're more bullish on Ethereum than on Bitcoin because of the um, regulation that you'd have to do just to uh, just to mine Bitcoin, I guess. And uh, at any point, the government can, uh, uh, well, shut down your mine or something like that. Um, no, so shut you down your that... miners? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I was just saying, so would you say that uh, you would like to see something more, um, less or rather less dependent on the U.S.? In, in that case, so that uh, Bitcoin will be mined, like, let's say, all over, I don't know, um, Iceland, um, Iran, I think, Kazakhstan, you know, countries like that, that, um, I guess, are providing a little bit more um, stability, you know, if it's spread out rather than being concentrated all in the US. Um, and I mean, what is your what is your thought, for example, on the um, infrastructure bill that was passed? Well, hopefully, in, uh, until 2024, we can change something. Do you think that's going to send um, a little bit of FUD into the... Uh, upcoming bull run that we are having now or do you think that's just gonna be because it's in two years people are not gonna care that much i think it it will definitely have so yeah as you as you mentioned right like ultimately it's not the leaving china is a good thing but concentrating is the bad thing whether it's in concentration in the us or any state for that matter any any nation state um the most important thing is for everything to be distributed that way, no one government can have too much control over the network. Um, so, yeah, that's in that first point. Um, and with regard to how the infrastructure bill is going to impact prices and, and so everything with regard to like the market, um, yes, of course, you know, people react very emotionally to the news. Um, generally, be out of ignorance, I think, in my opinion, it's like, oh my God, taxes. It's like, look, it's actually if it's it's actually a good thing if the U.S. starts to tax here in the US a lot, well then people are just gonna then leave the US and I think they'll end up going to El Salvador. I, I think that's the next best place for people to go because in El Salvador, they don't tax anything on Bitcoin. Like, and El Salvador wants to do that to encourage people to come and spend their money there and improve that country. And so I think that a lot of countries uh, who, are, who start catching on to this whole trend are also gonna adopt that same policy where instead of taxing Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, they're actually going to reduce their taxes on it to encourage people to start moving to those countries and providing more economic activity, which ultimately benefits the entire uh, society in that nation state as a whole. But I yeah, with regard to the mark, go ahead. I'm sorry. If, I hope that answered the question, but please ask any other follow-up questions. Oh, no, no, we did, Damien. Yeah, I was just going to say that I'm originally from Ukraine, and um, I think in Ukraine they're speaking right now about... Uh, Doing, I'm not saying that they will make Bitcoin a legal tender, just like in, in Salvador, but uh, I feel like um, they're talking about, um, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, taxing, um, or rather doing a zero tax on cryptocurrency 
and slowly but surely i think they will um, be i think the first country in europe who will um, make bitcoin legal tender and they will um just because i feel like the countries that will be um the pioneers for this are obviously going to be the more um not the the poor the less wealthy countries that need to i guess cut ties with the dollar to make sure that um not just the inflation is reduced but also that they are not um being dependent on the dollar that much um so i feel like ukraine is going to be the next one in europe i feel it's going to be the first one in europe i don't know if it's going to be the next one um in the world because i feel that maybe some of the other um south american or central american countries will will join el salvador um but i feel like that will be a good um uh, push for maybe other european countries just to join this and uh, i guess you know the more institutions we have the more countries we have guess, on our side um the quicker the general adoption will come um yeah yeah, yeah absolutely I, I agree 100 percent um that's exactly how i see everything playing out right el salvador did it because they need more economic activity which is why they said hey look all you bitcoiners have a lot of money we're gonna make it easy on you come out here please move out here and spend money in our country so that we grow as a whole right and that is a collective benefit and the only reason why other countries aren't following suit immediately is because not everybody's wrapped their head around this whole thing and the implications of it you know there's still a lot of people i mean just even young people, right, don't understand a lot of this stuff. And and they are they could be trading Doge and Shiba all day, uh, but not knowing exactly the future of this thing. And so, um, yeah, I think every other country will definitely be following suit. And the first ones to start doing it are definitely going to benefit the most. And ultimately, yeah, it's going to lead to, to exponential adoption once you start to see that El Salvador is improving, right? Every other country, particularly the small ones, are going to want to do uh basically provide the same benefits that el salvador has and more thank you damien yeah yeah no thanks for bringing that up it's super cool i really appreciate these chats this is very interesting to listen to people who oh, yeah, are no. more knowledgeable than me and uh just have this kind of uh, discussion instead of just watching this on youtube because that's what i was doing um i mean i'm only in crypto for about half a year um seriously maybe from end of february and um i don't know anyone in in my i guess in real life who i could talk to about this because people don't really care like when i started to invest back in um uh back in like properly back in april and uh, i told my friends i told some people you know about investments and uh um nobody really listened to me and uh, people kind of were just laughing at me like you know this is all scam uh you can't be serious and um only then after i started to make money and uh you know be able to talk about this um on a more deeper level uh, they started kind of following and that's where like the FOMO came in and uh, i mean even today i invited my friend into this chat uh, into this group and uh, he was like anti-crypto anti you know he was like the first guy against he was actually the person who um discouraged me to um get into crypto back in 2017 when i saw i think it was around autumn time that uh, market was picking up and um because he's into um, computer science and uh, cryptography i thought you know he would be the person to know and he said no it's like it's come on kind of along those lines yeah. and um i i basically asked i was like okay then i'm not gonna do anything <laughs> and then uh and then in, in the winter when i i realized i don't really like stocks and um i bought a couple of ETH, and uh, they they did quite good returns i was like okay maybe something else is there and i started to research more and um you know just watching youtube and all people uh, you know if i want to learn information it's just from youtube because i don't know anyone in my real in real life who would know um you know anything or like more than me because nobody cares about this you know i'm like the outsider everyone kind of looks at me like oh what are you doing um but now people are started to like really take notice because you know everything is um seeming to go well and um you know it's really nice to find this chat you know where you could actually talk to people who are very knowledgeable and you know like uh well like yourself and pax and uh it was um Hancock as well. I don't know if he's not here for the last few days, but um, just wanted to say that I really appreciate this, guys. Like I, I've been following, uh, I've been going to bed quite late just because I've been uh, um, listening to you. This I think uh, you guys come up closer towards uh, the evening in uh, like California. Or, you know, you're in the US. Um, you know, it's quite late here, but um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't stop me from not sleeping. So just to be in this chat. So thank you. <laughs> 
No, of course. I'm I'm super happy to hear that. And thanks for inviting because that's the whole point, right? Especially because it is hard to find people around you. Like even even myself, like in meat space, which is what I like to call everything outside of like this whole digital universe, like there aren't a whole lot of people around me who know it. Like my family, I've red pilled them. So they're in on it. You know, and I've bought them NFTs and I give them that way they kind of start to feel, oh, like that's cool. Like I'm the only one with this, you know? Um, and ultimately, like I think that's one of the best ways to bring people in. Like you know, to, if they're not going to buy it themselves, like I'll just give them some and then they can start watching the number go up and then they get super excited. But what's important, right, during this bull run, while, you know, everything's going up, it's easy to bring people in because they want to make money as well. Uh, but what's more important is teaching them and letting them understand why this is the future so that when the bull market, you know, kind of takes a dip, that they stick around and, and instead of running away or investing so that they can really, really win again uh, when the next bull run comes. And so that's why knowledge is power. And that's why this information is super important and why communicating and, and learning and growing with people who are like-minded in this space is uh, invaluable. So I really appreciate the kind words and, and everything. And, and I'm happy to hear that you're learning a lot because that's the whole point of this. And that's what I want to do. And I had, I had a huge smile on my face as you were explaining all that. So thank you. <laughs> nice to hear. Yeah, I definitely agree with you because I think if you're just here for the money, um, I mean, yeah, if you're lucky and you can just make a couple of Degen picks like Shiba and make millions, fair enough. Um, but if you also want to grow and uh, progress, not just, you know, money-wise, but uh, maybe you can connect your life with crypto, you can, uh, uh, well, change your life in a way that you would want, you know, instead of doing a job like, you know, I have a job which is quite good, actually, um, but I'm not really enjoying it that much. So, um, you know, I'm looking for other avenues for example you know i've started to really enjoy crypto and uh, you know it's something like it's almost an addiction you know like i'm um, i'm working from home and it's sometimes hard to just you know sit there and do my job because i'm um always researching something you know always learning something else like you know i've just done a course on edx on uh, on bitcoin and i'm going to do another one um and you know for example today i've heard about the wonderland time which i didn't know before and um i remember another day you told me about alchemix so i'll be researching um you know during the bear market if i should uh, you know a yield with one of them um you know it, it seems quite interesting you know both of these concepts i did not hear about them before i joined this group um so there's definitely you know you you always uh, you know learn something new every day and uh, you know, oh yeah you... oh go ahead sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you oh no no no, no that's it that's it yeah yeah that's the beautiful thing there's always something new to learn and, and you know there's a nice saying that i like to give myself um where it goes like what you know is smaller than your thumb. What you don't know, or what you know you don't know, is the size of your thumb. And what you don't even know you don't know is everything else all around you, right? No matter how much you learn. And when you have that sort of mentality, you just, as you said, you just want to digest more and more and more. And there's always something new. And uh, that's what keeps the space super exciting. And being so early, like there's so much to build and so much room for people to contribute uh, that that inevitably you get in here, you, you carve out a little piece for yourself, you're going to win no matter what, um, because the general trend is up <laughs> um, and, and this is the future. And so it's, I'm super happy that everyone's here and yourself too. And, uh, you know, I, and one thing I will say too, when it comes to the bull market, you know, it is easy to get distracted uh, because there's always a whole lot of excitement and FOMO in the air. And so I actually, I truly enjoy the bear market, not only because everything's at a discount, but because things are nice and quiet. You can kind of relax and and not feel like you're missing something every two seconds. Um, and I think uh, just pushing that narrative out to everybody so that everyone can benefit from that is a really, really big priority of mine uh, with this group. And you and you mentioned Damien. Um, you know, uh, you know, we. I mean, right now, and you know, and in these in this market and previous market cycles. Uh, you know, gaining, you know, anywhere between 400% to, uh, you know, thousands percent gains. Um, and then uh, when do you think we'll start seeing, like, you know, more smaller percentage gains? Like, for example, uh, the way we see it, we see it in the stock market, you know, 5 10% gains. How long will yeah, that take? So, you know, I think we're a ways away from that, actually. Um, and while I'm kind of keen <laughs> on seeing a, a bear market come along, because you know that's when yields are going to go back up um, even more. I mean, they're already they're still great, <laughs> but they'll be even greater, um, and things will stay exciting. I, I, I'm pretty sure we're a ways away. I would say at least five, ten years before we start to see uh, returns that are similar to that. 
of uh, like traditional finance. But even even then, like it's all about being early, right? So if a new project comes out with some new primitive, then if you get in early, like you're going to have 100x gains, 1000x gains. Um, because even I've seen phenomenal gains in just uh, like 100x gains in the stock market, right? Like it's very much possible. It's just all about researching, understanding a project or a company and understanding where they're going and, and being a part of it as early as possible. So there will, there will always be gems coming out, whether it's in traditional finance or, or this new financial world, ultimately this one, because this is where everything's going to go. Um, but it's all about just uh, being a savvy investor and staying up to date with what's going on and, and having like your, your realm of confidence, right? Like mine is in particular technology. I've always invested in, in tech stocks because it's what I'm familiar with. Like I, I won't invest in, um, I don't know why. Well, I mean, I, technology is kind of all over the place. So I kind of, and having studied economics, I kind of see a lot of action all over the place, but let's just say like, like dog food, right? Uh, the, the pet industry, because it is an, an industry of its own. Like I don't invest in that because I don't have a dog. I don't have a cat and I don't really know, you know, where there will be value. I don't know what, what's a really great product. What's not, you know, like there are some things that I thought were a joke in the pet industry and they ended up catching on and really being really big. But it's because I don't understand the nuances of being a pet owner that I, I have not. Right. And that's totally fine. I don't care. I'm not like sad or, or upset that I missed out on that. I'm actually glad that another collective organization was able to create a product and generate value for people because ultimately that's what an economy is all about. Um, but it's just, you know, again, like under, have like three industries that you really like uh, and understand very deeply and pay attention to them and focus on what's coming out. And you're going to be able to catch those gems. So that's my advice there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Hey, Damien. Sure. What's up? I, I was, well, I'm going off what you said before about the dreamers. I was looking, as, as we were talking, I was looking on OpenSea. I found one I really liked. There's two questions. One, does it matter, you know, which one you get? And if it's for you personally, not so much for profit, does it matter, like, which generation? Because I'm relatively new. So I see that it's a, there's different generations. There's, you know, all different things to it. That that's one question. Does it matter which generation? And two, um, is there a way around, or when is the best time for the lowest gas fees? Because the one I'm looking at is like two hundred and fifty dollars, you know, worth of ETH, and then it's like six fifty in gas. So good questions. Um, first, with regard to Dreamers specifically, um, the real utility of Dreamers has yet to be realized. They haven't come out with the game. Um, where you're going to earn the passive income uh, it doesn't come out until Q3 of 2022. And it's not something that they've published. Only the people who have been in the Discord know about it. And actually, not even that, they didn't even publish it in, inside of the Discord. They only spoke of it once in a Twitter space the, that I jumped into where they're going to be producing a game that will yield uh, tokens for you. And so it's kind of insider knowledge um, and nobody knows about it, which is why they're so undervalued right now. Um, but really, yeah. So just as you said, like pick one you like, um, and, and, you know, put it as your profile picture to show it off and, and cause it's super fun. Um, and, and just hold from there. I mean, of course there's rarities and I posted in the whiteboard channel, um, the rarity tools. So you can go ahead and, and find, you can look, you can, uh, filter by trait. Like, let's say you want one, um, that has like heart glasses or shades or a skeleton or a Nazulian or Valendian or whatever, or Levendian, right? Whatever you want. Um, and then just pick it up. And with regard to the, the gas fees, um, yeah, right now gas is at 333 Guay, um, most likely because there was a minting uh, of some NFT as we were on this conversation. And that is, that is really high, <laughs> you know, like that only happens when there is a huge minting event. Which means what that means is that there was a smart contract deployed and a lot of people are minting an nft and whenever there's a, a great demand for transactions on the network the price goes up because every transaction your gas fee is basically a bid to have your transaction written onto ethereum so when there's a lot of people competing for what's called block space a space like a, a space for their transaction to be written it goes up 
Um, but I, on average, during this run, uh, everything has been between like 100 to 200. Um, I would say a, a good discounted rate right now is about 100 guay. And uh, I've posted in the in the general chat, the Alphaverse, if I'm not mistaken, um, the extension that I use to monitor that. It's called uh, the DeFi Saver. DeFi Saver is a great product, by the way. Um, the DeFi Saver uh, Gas Chrome extension, you can install and pin it onto the, the top right of your browser. And then you'll just have a, a, your eye on gas prices at all times. That way you can find out when's the best time to start doing some stuff. Because like, you know, over 150, I would say, uh, you know, it's kind of expensive. Around 100 guay right now is about the average. And after the FUD happened with the whole um, bill that came out, it dropped to about as low as like 60, which is pretty great. Um, but I, I don't, everything kind of picked back up in just the last day or two. So I would say um, maybe check out that extension or you can just go on, you can look up like Ethereum gas. I think like gasnow.org or something. Yeah, I'm looking um, at it right now. Yeah, perfect. And then you can just keep an eye on that, check it periodically. And, and I think you can even set up a notification once it hits like 150. Uh, then I would say it's a good time to go ahead and, uh, and mint your, or I'm sorry, to purchase the, the NFT. That way you don't have to pay this, you know, unnecessarily high amount of gas. So you said you think like 150, around 150 would be reasonable because I saw 650 and I was like, that's not happening. Oh, yeah, I know. 650 is crazy. No, I would wait until it hits about 150. And I, okay. would, I would honestly say like in 20, 30 minutes or so, uh, it should start to drop. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And it's already, it dropped just to 268 in just the past couple of minutes. So yeah, it'll, it'll trickle 50. down. Yeah, I see 270 right now. So two, yeah, 269. Cool. Yeah, just to, because I have Dreamers on my screen right now, just to speak more on that, like, I don't know if you guys have heard about the, like the, the cyber Kongs, right? And how they earn bananas. Um, but in that same way, that's how dreamers are going to work uh, with the game that's coming next year. And what's really interesting too about them is that if you have a dreamer and it's battling for you, right, to earn that yield, um, if you buy dream loops, which are BitLectro's first project, uh, first release, you actually power up your dreamer. So you'll be able to increase the chances of yourself, of your dreamer winning battles with the purchase of dream loops. Uh, which is pretty cool. They're like buffs, essentially. Uh, if you know what those are like in the gaming context, they're like power-ups. And so that's what makes it really cool. And it's good for BitLectro. Obviously, they've designed it like that so that, to encourage people to um, have both. But um, ultimately, it's going to serve you in the long run, too. That's awesome. I, and I like the fact that they're doing the banana equivalent. Exactly. Yeah. And, and instead of just having like a fixed rate at which you uh, earn them, your, your uh, dream token or whatever they're going to call it, uh, you can give yourself an edge uh, by powering up your dreamer. And so once people realize that, I ex expect a lot of interesting price action on both dreamers and dream loops. Um, and the cool thing too, um, like just, just one like extremely concrete example of these tokenomics working very well is when before the dreamers dropped, Right. If you held dream loops in your wallet, at least two for every two dream loops that you had in your wallet, you would get one free dreamer just airdropped. You just have to go claim it. And okay. so when like at that time before that was announced, the floor price for dream loops was 0 0.02 ETH. But right around that time, uh, up until the snapshot, we, uh, dream loops went up to 0 0.2 each. Right. So oh, like, wow. there was a a 10x literally it happened as soon as it was announced they jumped up from 0 0.02 to 0 0.08 like within a day and in just a matter of a few days they were all the way up at like 0 0.17 0 0.18 0 0.19 0 0.2 because ultimately to have a whole dreamer for free uh was pretty great so yeah just one just one demonstration of all that work and uh which is super cool like it, it, the guy who one of the founding members of bitlectro is actually a, has a phd in game theory and economics um, and so everything within everything by BitLectro has been designed by a really, really smart guy uh, who knows what he's doing. So can I ask you a question about Dreamers? Um, I heard you guys talking about it and I went on the uh, OpenSea. So I can see the price floor is uh, not 0.029. Um, but if I wanted to buy one, 
would there be something that I should look for or just uh, basically buy anything because I'm not really sure which ones are rare and which ones are more common. The price seems to be very similar on all of them around uh, 150 to about um, $250. So I dropped in whiteboard. There's a rarity tools link. So I don't know if it's the last thing in there, but it, if you scroll up a little bit, you'll find it. Um, and you can use that if you want to use rarity to guide your decision. But more importantly, I think it should just be whatever you like, you know, whether that's one with a crown, a party hat or, or laser eyes. And I think the laser eyes on dreamers look really cool. Um, but just also as a whole, like what I love about dreamers is that they're GIFs rather than JPEGs. Right. So just having that dynamic element is, is super fun and cool. But I say I tell everyone, like, just go by whatever catches your eye, whatever you, you like the most. And and because no matter what, like, I, I believe all of the base ones are going to have like the same uh, like ability to win. Um, and it's all going to be dependent on like how many dream loops you have to power them as well. So, yeah. Also, I need to buy dream loops as well. Not just a dreamer, but also a dream loop. If you want to have like power ups for your dreamer uh, in the game, yes. But you said the game is going to come out in Q3, so almost in a year. Yeah, so in a good while. So there's plenty of time. I think the, the dreamers and dream loops are going to be available at a really great price for a good while. Well, that is until uh, Q1 of next year when you can start walking around the sandbox as your dreamer. You know, it's like, well, oh, you know, everyone might be naked in the sandbox or not have anything super interesting. But when you start walking, they start seeing a bunch of dreamers all over the place, which you can believe that we are definitely going to be showing off our, our 3D versions. Um, I think we're going to see some pretty cool uh, price action then. So right now, now they're they're available for a really good rate. And I mean, how cool is it to turn this 2D thing into a 3D version? Uh, so that's something I'm super excited for. Yeah, so who yeah that's pretty amazing. Like, how does that go into a 3D version of it? So essentially, um, when you go into the sandbox, um, if they're going to read the metadata associated with what's in your wallet, um, and you're going to be able to just change your your outfit uh, into your dreamer. Yeah. So the dreamers, like, they don't look like they have an outfit. Like, it's 2D at the moment. Right. So how does that convert to a 3D space? So they're building everything right now, actually. That's what they're working on. They have a bunch of 3D artists uh, creating a 3D okay. version of every single trait uh, that the Dreamers have. And so once you step into the sandbox, they'll just be instantiated automatically based on the what you have in your metadata and their associated 3D version. Yeah, sweet. And the music it plays, can you just randomly start playing that, do you reckon? In like the sandbox? I don't or? know. I don't know how they're going to incorporate. They haven't spoken on how the music is going to play in the sandbox, but I imagine potentially, right? Like you'll be able to play it around you just like a boom box or something. And that'd be pretty cool. Uh, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Hey, Damien, as far as, as far as the dreamers go, uh, you said that in time, you know, it, you can uh, make passive income and stuff like that. Do you have to be a part of the game in order to get that benefit or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, you will have to um, be, quote unquote, playing the game. Um, you don't actually actively have to do it. Like for X Infinity, it's, it's, a, it's an active game, right? Where you have to actually play uh, with your phone or your device to earn. Uh, but that's the cool thing with Dreamers is that it's going to just be completely passive. And the way that you play is by like staking your Dreamer, which is really cool, right? Because when you stake something, what you're saying is, okay, I'm taking this, you know, I'm not going to have it in my wallet ready to sell. But instead, I'm putting it into the smart contract, right? And there's a gas fee associated with that. And so if you want to remove your Dreamer, you have to pay another gas fee. And that's a deterrent, right, from, from unstaking your uh, Dreamer, combined with the fact that it's earning for you, right? So if you have Dreamers, you're going to want to throw them all into the smart, con the smart contract. That way, they just earn you passive income. Um, and it's also because they're in the smart contract and not, say, on OpenSea for sale, Right, that ultimately reduces the circulating supply, uh, which is renders it a deflationary NFT at that point, uh, which is pretty cool. How are they? How are they earning you income if you're not playing a game? Like, yeah, I'm like, I'm not picturing it. So they're actually developing their own engine for the whole game uh, because they weren't able to find one that does exactly that thing, 
where all you have to do is, is stake the dreamer and it'll battle other dreamers and and earn you income every time they they win and so that's that's basically how it is it, that's the incentive like stake your dreamer don't put it up for sale and you're going to get paid in the dream token and and then you're going to be able to do a bunch of cool stuff with that um whether that's selling it or you like further <laughs> like taking that and staking it elsewhere uh, and earning even more of it um they kind of hinted at some of those economics at play but it's something that they're still designing but it's basically going to be like cyber kong's version two in my opinion cool yeah, so would you say it's good sorry no go ahead you guys would you say it's good to um stock up on dreamers then because from what i've heard you saying that they will appreciate in price quite a bit yeah um, i mean a lot of my friends and I have at least double digits of these things. I know a couple of guys who have hundreds of dreamers themselves. So you would you would say it's a good idea to buy like I can buy like ten of them and just hold them and as you said stake them and then see if, uh, if the game comes out if I want to play if I want to uh, flip them or you know whatever. But uh, it's basically it's also it's a good investment as well. Yeah, so that's what I intend on doing. I have a bunch that I have left frozen still. And with the ones that I have revealed, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and stake a lot of them and then just ride the appreciation and take a sum of them out and sell them off, right? And basically flip them after holding onto them for a year after their value has really been realized. Oh, that's, I, I was actually looking for a good NFT project to, uh, well, not just to flip, just to see, you know, uh, if I can find one. And uh, I've been looking because I've been in, uh, in crypto, as I said, for half a year, but. I never really got into NFT properly because uh, I don't think there's time. You know, if you if you look into like DeFi and gaming and metaverse and you know Polkadot, whatever, um, you can't be an expert in everything. So I feel like after listening to you, the Dreamers should be uh, <laughs> an NFT project that I've been looking for. So uh, yeah, if the ETH fees are not too high, I'll definitely get uh, yeah maybe up like ten of them or something because they seem yeah. quite affordable now. Yeah, yeah. So the way that I organize my portfolio is that I have like a long term HODL portfolio that I don't touch. And then I have like short term stuff, right? Shorter term stuff. Not I don't, you know, trade on a daily, but like on a quarterly or monthly basis, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's also the same thing that you should do with your NFTs, right? Have some that you hold long term for their appreciation and ultimate cash flow and return that they earn you, but also you know there's ways that you can make short-term gains too like joy i royce who's in here he's pretty well versed with uh how all that's playing out and he's pretty new to crypto uh, he started with uh, nfts and so like the other day um he mentioned it in the chat uh fur balls right they're actually free you can just get them now they're not but initially they were free minting and so you got your fur ball and if you staked it it would start earning you fur which is the token and this fur, once you accumulate enough of it, you can use to mint uh, like a second generation fur ball. And that second generation fur ball, you can also stake and only increase the amount of fur that you receive. And ultimately, that token has value by with amongst whoever wants to play that game too, right? So it's it's a very similar model to the whole bananas thing that CyberCong started. And I, I see the best NFT projects are going to have all that same thing, uh, all those same mechanics. And so just like in normal uh, DeFi, when you're looking into a project, you always want really interesting tokenomics in play. Uh, NFT projects have their equivalent of that. Uh, just, you know, this different lingo and, and different mechanics. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about uh, staking and yielding and increasing scarcity uh, so that you can go ahead and drive the value of the underlying assets, which are in this case, dreamers. Thank you for this. Sorry, a stupid question now, as I'm not really into NFTs, um, but I would definitely like to get into them. Where would you stake Dreamers? So they haven't um, created the smart contract yet, uh, but as soon as they do, uh, I'll definitely share it. And I also urge you to join the Discord. A lot of cool guys, and it's pretty fun in there, and I'm active in there uh, as well. I, the past few days, I've been super busy building a lot of stuff for the community, um, but otherwise, like, before this started, like I was in there almost every day because there's a lot of cool guys and you know we all chat about not only dreamers but also any other NFT projects that we might be in and, and just crypto as a whole. And you know, I, I always tell everyone like the first and most important thing of everything is to have fun with this stuff because 
that's it is super fun all of the economics and and game theory and and you know all that i mean i find fascinating and super fun and, and i think once you really dig in uh and understand all of it uh <laughs> you will too thank you thank you damien yeah of course Like I bought some dreamers as a Christmas presents for some family, actually. <laughs> so that's going to be that's fun cool. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think a, a lot of people have been talking about doing that too, and and that's another reason why I'm super bullish uh, for the next few months because now people who maybe weren't into it at all now that they're going to receive them as gifts and and kind of be red pilled, you know, because people, you know, family, you know, when it comes to family, once you're an adult and everyone kind of, and you, if you don't live at home, everyone kind of does their own thing and lives in their own bubble. But now all of these bubbles, social bubbles are going to be colliding once again, when everyone's sitting around the dinner table at Thanksgiving, talking about how their year's gone and the things for which they're thankful, all that good stuff. And, you know, that in, in my experience, Thanksgiving during a bull run always just triggers a lot of FOMO and even more bullishness. Um, and around Christmas, there's going to be a, a, there's always like the week or two uh, preceding it, a little bit of a sell off because people want to buy gifts and whatnot uh, for right. the family. Um, but right after that, you know, then, then new year's comes along and everyone's like, oh, this is the year that I'm going to start my financial journey and all that good stuff. Right. And people start to invest in crypto and diversify and all that good stuff. And so, uh, a lot of, uh, bullish events happening, uh, in, in the next few months. And I don't think any FUD will really impact it much at all. And so that, that that's just something to kind of keep in mind that at the end of the day, more people are going to be in this and paying attention. Um, and as they learn about it, which is the most important thing. This place is only going to grow. Yeah, that's great. It makes sense for sure. I mean, you know, you mentioned the um, was the website where you can um, have notifications for the gas fees. Uh, could, could you let me know what it is, please? Sure. Yeah. Here, I'll drop the link right now on the whiteboard, and then you can oh, go you. ahead and uh, use that. Yeah. One sec. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. I'll be right there. All right, gentlemen, it looks like my uh, my dinner's ready, so I'm going to go do that. It's good talking to you guys. Likewise, man. Cheers. Enjoy your dinner. Yeah, thanks. Have a good night. Have a good night. I'm going to go too, guys. Thank you so much for this whole thing. Like, it, But it's 3 a.m. over here, so I just have to sleep. <laughs> 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 no worries no worries man i barely sleep so i'll probably be up until then about two so have a good night man it was nice having you yeah thank you thank you man yo damien what's up bro i'm buying dreamers man you 100 percent convinced me i heard you last night i mean like the day before and then now i'm definitely gonna get into it now i'm just saying <laughs> cool yeah i'm glad i'm excited to see uh which dreamers you guys pick up uh, by the way, I just dropped that link into the, on in the whiteboard. Yeah, I've just seen it. Thanks. It's two to two now, which is not too bad. But I'm I think I'm gonna wait. Did you say you think dreamers are not gonna be appreciating too much in the next uh, few days at least? They'll be side trading. No. Yeah, I don't think in the next few days. I would say Q1 um, is where you're gonna see some interesting price action. Unless there's a bunch of you know people who dreamers who go home and tell their families uh, around Thanksgiving <laughs> and Christmas. Um, but I, I don't, I mean, maybe, but I'm more bullish on once we're instantiated in, in the sandbox, that's when, you know, we're going to start showing off and be a lot more visible because the team hasn't wanted to waste any money on advertising or marketing or anything like that. Um, which is why it's kind of like a, a stealth project right now, which is actually a really good thing. You know, you want to be in things early before everyone else. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have like a situation like the crypto punks where they blew up and, and now they're out of reach of everyone because Anybody who bought CryptoPunks way back in 2017 obviously is pretty darn happy right now. And But no, but everyone was probably laughing. Uh, well, everyone I know definitely was laughing back then uh, when I was buying like CryptoKitties uh, back in 2016, 2017.
Um, and, and it's just the same thing, you know, it's just, it's a function of time, right? Over time, all of this gets out. And if the art is cool and the utility is there, they will appreciate inevitably. Same thing with CyberKongs and all that good stuff. Well, it's also about the community, isn't it? I feel like CyberKongs and CryptoPunks are, obviously they're not just a little JPEGs which anyone can draw, but it's about the community that they bring together and the ideas oh, yeah. they can share and uh, what it, uh, you know, um, gets enticed together instead of just uh, um, having a few pictures, you know, but um, actually sharing ideas and uh, going through the journey together. Um, and it's like now become an elite club, which, uh, you know, only millionaires can join. So, <laughs> right. Absolutely. And, and that happens over time, right? Like people who bought dreamers and, and paper handed them and whatnot, right? Like they got eliminated. They're probably not OGs in crypto at all. Uh, whereas the people who have been like everyone I know who has a lot of dreamers has been in Ethereum for a really long time and sees the roadmap and, and sees the value of them long-term. And ultimately, like the people who don't believe just end up kind of weeding themselves out. And so what happens is you end up ha having this OG collector society of everyone who believed in the NFT project from the very beginning. And so it's just, it's just a very slow process of elimination that kind of just happens on its own. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, thank you so much for, well, for Dreamers, for Wonderland, for Alchemix. It's just in a couple of days, um, a lot of new things I've learned. <laughs> yeah yeah of course fun stuff <laughs> yeah very fun definitely so when you buy the dreamer you have to pay like a minimum of 150 gas for each one that you buy um yes for every every transaction there is a gas fee uh which is why generally if you're gonna buy a few of something i do recommend on OpenSea buying bundles uh that way you only pay one gas fee and you get a few of them at once how can you buy a bundle so when you go to the collection um, through OpenSea's filter system, you can go ahead and you'll see single items. You'll see a drop down. It says single items and bundles. You can just click on that, hit bundles, and you'll see if, if there are any bundles for sale, uh, you'll be able to buy them like that. Um, filter. Sorry, I'm just looking now. Oh, items, awesome. Single items, bundles. Just trying to figure out this. Oh, so there's two dreamers together. Okay, so then you can't really select which ones. You could kind of get whatever. So a bundle of three right. dreamers, no point one ETH. That's not too okay. Oh, that's perfect. Right, Thank right. you. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the trade off where you don't necessarily get to hand pick which ones are in that bundle, uh, but you get to save on gas, right? And being that you know gas right now is about one whole dreamer on its own. If you're just looking to collect a few, uh, like let's say you buy one or two that you really love and you're willing to pay the gas for them. But then you just, at that point, now I just want a, a few comments to kind of stock up on. Uh, then you can go ahead and use bundles for that. And that's that's my strategy. That's perfect. I mean, I've just seen this three, yeah, three, two together. Um, oh, wow. I might get one now. I just, I never traded on Ethereum, so it's going to be new for me. I've just been trading on, uh, well, on everything other than ETH. So, you know, Binance, Phantom, uh, Polygon, um, Solana. <laughs> but I've just been avoiding ETH. Uh, just because of the huge, you know, crazy gas fees, but um, um, I just can't wait. I just want to buy one now. <laughs> Literally, like I want to buy some now. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't have any money on my on my um, MetaMask, so I'll need to bridge it maybe from ETH, uh, from BNB to uh, to ETH, um, and then yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, probably gonna try and buy them. <laughs> yeah, gas is pretty high right now. It went back up to three forty three. Let's let's see what's doing that. I'm gonna check it out. One second. I have 343. There's a certain time I think Pax was saying that it's cheaper. Uh, I just have this form and now I just want to buy. <laughs> oh, no. Generally, generally gas is going to be lowest when the least people are on Ethereum, which typically coincides with like really late hours in the US. Um, so like between uh, my experience, like midnight to 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., um, and then once every well, mostly just midnight to 3 a.m. Because at 3 a.m. it's already 6 a.m. Uh, on the East Coast, and people start to wake up and, and degen right away. <laughs> so would you say midnight? That's um, Pacific time. Yeah, yeah, PST. Yeah, sorry. So that's seven. I I'm in London, so I just need to calculate. I think it's plus seven. Um, let's see. Oh, so it's like 7 a.m. Okay, that's basically. When I wake up for work, just okay. 
I'll wake up tomorrow. I'll put some money in on the, on ETH and uh, yeah, get some get some dreamers. <laughs> cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm excited to see if anyone gets a dreamer. You post it as your pr profile picture. That'll be pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. I'll add it as my profile picture on the on the um, on Discord. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's super cool too because even in Discord you can put GIFs um, as your profile picture, and so like if you mouse over, you can start to see it kind of move there, and I think that's kind of exciting. Better than just like a boring old JPEG. Like to me, Dreamers and all of the wonderful economics I play kind of make a lot of other projects look like crap, to be honest. Uh, what are you doing, Damien? You just <laughs> I feel like I just need to buy like ten or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it looks like Chain Runners, Shiba Inu, of course, um, from Sushi Swamp. A lot of people are buying ENS domains, which I do recommend everyone to do too. Uh, if you haven't gone on ens.domains uh, and have claimed your your uh, ETH domain, I, I do recommend that because instead of like sharing your long contract address, you know, the zero X and let's follow by a string of characters, uh, you can just say like, Hey, send it over to you know doza.eth, and, and you'll go ahead and re, you know receive it just like that. So it's a lot easier, and I think, and also when you go into when you start using DApps and stuff, you know how your contract address or your wallet address shows up in the top right. Uh, it'll show your name instead, which is kind of cool. Okay, so you just register. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, sorry. You go on. Sorry. Oh, I was just asking if you can post a link to that so I can have a look when I get home. Sure, yeah, yeah. I'll post it on the whiteboard. Yeah, cheers. Hey, Damien, what are you uh, using to look at the... Uh... I guess you'd call it like the traffic on the Ethereum network that's like kind of causing the higher gas fees. I'll post a link to that too. Awesome, thank you, man. Yeah, I think you convinced yes, a that's... lot of people to buy the Dreamers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, it's a project that I, I really believe in and I think is one of the coolest right now uh, on Ethereum. You know, of course, there's a lot of other ones going on too, and I, I'm excited for Royce to speak on that because he, he seems to have a pretty good thumb on that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think I think he's he said he's happy to present uh, in the next couple of days or next week. Uh, so we'll post the schedule that way everyone can kind of see how he's been making some money. Like he got uh, one of the fur balls for free and he flipped it not even twenty four hours later for one point two five ETH, which is pretty nice, of course. So uh, yeah, I think that'll be pretty cool for everyone to see. That'd be sick, yeah. But yeah, so that. Um, that link I just posted, ultrasound.money, uh -huh. when you look at the burn leaderboard, uh, you're going to see a whole bunch of different smart contracts and their names and a number next to them. That's how much ETH they have caused to burn because of how much on-chain activity has been associated with their specific contract. And so that's how I track what's hot. Like when I see a spike in gas, I immediately check out ultrasound.money uh, so I can go ahead and see, oh, like that, I'll look at the, I'll do like quick, Two minute, five minute research on the project and decide whether or not I want to buy. Gotcha. So on the burn leaderboard, like where it says like Uniswap V2 and then like 1794 ETH. Yeah, exactly. So gotcha. whether depending on whatever time frame you have right there, uh, you can see uh, what's going on with it. And generally, yeah, Uniswap's at the top because everyone's swapping all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Tether, obviously, people are selling in and out. Um, V3, of course, and Ethereum name service, which is the ENS domains that I shared. Uh, OpenSea, obviously, because people are buying a lot of NFTs. And that's a good way to also, it's a good signal for whether or not the NFT market is strong. Um, mm -hmm. Like, because if OpenSea is at the top, that means there's a lot of activity, economic activity going on. And so, like, there was a bit of an NFT bear market. And I would say we're kind of still in it at large, but obviously, there are people swapping a lot. And I would say that the OpenSea burn leaderboard has a lot to do with um, a lot of new projects coming out right now. Mostly, probably from uh, the ones that are new, because you know, as soon as someone buys a few NFTs or mints a few NFTs, they immediately put them on OpenSea, and, and there's a whole lot of activity. And it's always pretty exciting, honestly. Like if you've been following a, uh, a project for a little while, 
um, to see like right away after minting, people start posting them uh, for, on secondary markets to go ahead and like sell and flip. And you'll just, if you just sit there on the collection and hit refresh, you'll see the, the floor one just <laughs> changing consistently for the next like couple of days as people are like trading and buying and selling and stuff. It's super cool. Yeah. So quick question about like the dreamers. And I don't know if you'll have a recommendation on this, but for like a first time buyer, would you say that we should probably like limit ourselves on the difference between like the floor price and what we were like willing to pay? Like, do you think we should kind of find something that's more so close to floor price rather than something that's like, for example, maybe like 0.1 ETH or should we really just kind of go off of how we feel? I just, uh, I, I don't really know too much about the project. I just think it looks super cool. Um, so I was just wondering, like valuation wise, what you'd recommend as like a first time purchase. So most people use rarity tools. Wait, I posted a link to that. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, so usually people use that to inform the decisions. Um, but you know, I, I would take that into account to a degree. Um, ultimately, yeah, more, more rarity generally does equal more value in the long run. Um, but right now, I mean, uh, there's a lot of really cool looking ones that are undervalued. And ultimately, again, like who cares if one is super rare if it looks like crap? You know, uh, it has to be desirable. You know, someone has to be proud to put it as their uh, as their profile picture. Um, so I would say, yeah, right now a lot of them are undervalued. Just pick whatever you like. So would you say rarity of like what's like the cool cool rarity and like what's the good rarity, I guess, and what's kind of the more common rarity? What would you say? Sorry, I'm just I'm just so new, but are you really excited about this the dreamers? So I just wanted to find out a bit more. Sure, yeah. So if you go in the rarity um, and you look at all the different traits, um, you can see how many there are with each trait. So like, for example, uh, if you click on clothing and you click on, let's say, like the baseball jersey, right? Before you click on it, you'll see that there are 136. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm... Oh, yeah, no, this is the right one. Um, you'll see how many there are with the baseball jersey. And then it'll get filtered from there. And then let's say you also, you want one with a baseball jersey and a clown nose, uh, then you can go ahead and, and click on that. Like if I click on baseball jersey and clown, I can see there's only one that has that specific combination. And that one is not for sale, the Dreamer 101. Uh, and so that's, it's really a combination of things that kind of dictate its rarity. But I would say like determine which, like kind of just go on the collection on OpenSea, browse a lot of them and see what you like the most, like which traits. Uh, and then go to rarity tools and and start filtering by what you like and and use that to kind of inform your buying decision. So uh, for and example, I'm I'm looking like rarity right. like four hundred. That's that's very high. That's good, right? And then I presume rarity fifty. That's not that high. It's I would say well, out of fifteen thousand four hundred is is not bad at all actually. Or would you say it's the other? Sorry, I'm just a bit confused. So if it's rarity fifty or if it's rarity four hundred. What would be better? Is it the higher the better or the lower the better? Oh, you're talking about the rarity score. Yeah, the higher the, the rarity score. score, the more rare it is. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So one thing you can do is you can place an offer for it. You don't have to just pay the price. Right, exactly. Yeah, like somebody can have it. Let's say there's one for sale for one ETH. You can send them an offer for 0 0.9 and, and they might just accept it, right? And then you get a discount. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at some of the. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I was going to say that some of the rare ones, uh, they're quite expensive. Like you can see, like two ETH, number one, five, two, where it is called 500. Um, so, yeah, you can probably, I think if you scout well enough, I think you can find something quite rare, not too much, um, not to overpay for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. In my opinion, I mean, obviously, the, the... I think the assets will only go up uh, as everything starts, as the project develops. Um, but yeah, I would say like, if you're trying to maximize your return, instead of buying one rare one, like let's say there's one right now for 420, oh, 420, 69, um, <laughs> right? Like that one might go up to, you know, 10, 15 ETH or something like that, which would be Jesus. a pretty good return, right? But Tenny. if you get... I mean, I'm I'm pretty bullish, like I said, because what? I think these are beautiful. And like, they're what I really love what the Dreamer, the Electro has done with their project is they've really built in a lot of nostalgia, right? Like with the music, with the art, 
um and like with there being like a, there's a freddy krueger there's a jason there's a uh there's obviously like some blade runner characters in there there's bob ross i know i've heard a few people in here mention the bob ross and so when someone sees that you know whether it connects with them personally or is just something that reminds them of their childhood like the mega man like that i think is a really really bullish sign because now you're going to be able to bring not only young people who like this stuff but also old people <laughs> no offense but like older people who had maybe played these things as um as kids well you seem to be very bullish wow you're saying that the return on the dreamers could be around i don't know 100 decks or something <laughs> wow yeah well i mean ultimately it's going to depend on and that's why i say the art right like for example the jason right like no one's the whoever holds that is definitely not going to sell it um and ultimately like when people will start looking at dreamers so they're not going to recognize well some of them aren't are, a lot of them aren't modeled after anyone but you know who doesn't want a freddy krueger or, or a jason or something like that right something that is uh recognizable um and so like with regard to those or like the santa outfit or like i know a lot of people <laughs> have been bullish and really crazy for the the ones holding a cube or like a, the rubik's cube one of my friends uh vegan vegan bot uh he was he went crazy i think he has like 120 of these things or more um and he didn't get a single one that was holding a rubik's cube and so he's been <laughs> really uh, gunning after anybody who has it and of course nobody wants to sell it uh which is kind of funny okay i don't know i, I feel like you're making me i really want to buy like 10 of them or 20 of them <laughs> wow i mean okay. yeah i mean i i have you know, d well into the double digits, and, and I don't intend on selling any, any of mine anytime soon. And there's even some vendors in there, too. So if you watch Futurama, uh, I know a lot of people have really liked their vendors. Yeah. Dude, if anybody has a uh, 1.5 ETH that they're willing to spare me, uh, the Terminator one looks really cool. I think 905 tossed that in the chat earlier, too. Yeah, Dreamer8719. Yeah, that one's pretty cool. Oh wow, five five four. So around um rarity score of around four hundred, five hundred, that's that's quite high, you would say. That's pretty good. Yeah, especially if it's like a common one that isn't a one of one. Yeah, I would say that's pretty cool. There's even a naked one too, Dreamer 103. <laughs> there are a few that are naked. 103. So are there rare ones which are um which don't have too high rarity score? Oh, hold on one second. Sorry, I'm getting a call. Hold on, guys. I'll be right back. I got to take this. <laughs> 